Hi everybody and welcome to Coffee and Property. My name's David Hanna. Our guest today is Vanessa from Property Tribes. First and foremost, we're here at Old Billingsgate at the end of the National Landlord Investment Show. And apologies if you can hear background noise because there is a party going on outside. But nevertheless, we're here to talk to Vanessa because, frankly, Vanessa, you've had a really interesting career before Property Tribes. And we've talking before we started the video, admittedly over a beer, which I've now finished. And you started your career in broadcast media and particularly MTV, didn't you? And what was that like? Well, it, it was the most amazing job in the world. Um, I went to MTV uh, working behind the scenes just uh, six months after it launched in Europe. Obviously, wow. it was a massive phenomenon in America, but it came over to Europe. Um, we were in Camden in North London, and I got a job there about six months after they launched. Um, and it was just an in incredible time. And I ended up being a presenter of um, the, the rock music show. And I did that for 10 years. I think I'm one of the longest serving VJs in the history of MTV. Um, and I got to fly all over the world with the most incredible bands and just go to amazing places and make, uh, meet amazing people and um, just be part of an incredible music scene with so many talented people. So it was just, uh, you know, it was a dream job in a million, basically. I, yeah, I, I, first and foremost is, is, you know, 10 years as a VJ for a rock show. I'm amazed you can even hear me. <laughs> Indeed. Um, you know, we all know, hey, it's rock and roll and all the rest of it, but, it, you know, that must have been an incredible theme. So, but, but then why the transition into property and then ultimately to property tribes? What happened? Well, as I like to quip, I went from rock and roll to bricks and mortar. And I think it was really because um, towards the end of my time at MTV, they started to change their, their kind of policies um, and they decided uh, for some unknown reason to get rid of all their specialist music shows. So they got rid of um, you know, the dance music show, the rap show, my show, the indie music show. So I essentially lost my job and I had to reinvent myself. I worked behind the scenes again as, uh, as a music um, producer and director. Um, I think my main claim to fame is that I directed Motorhead's 25th anniversary concert at Brixton Academy. Really? Yeah, wow. um, I did a big music special for Channel 4 called Latino Loco. I did quite a few music videos and music specials um, and then I found that um, I, I was working as an independent producer and director and I found that you know it, it, I was working very very long hours I would be in an edit suite for like 14 hours or something like that um, it was getting very stressful YouTube was starting to come through so commissions were harder to get and then I met my lovely husband Nick who was a cameraman um, and we just decided that we wanted to do something very, very different uh, because we could see that our time in the broadcast media was coming to an end and we actually wanted it to for quality of life, life reasons. Uh, we're very, very outdoorsy people. We wanted to travel and be outdoors. Um, and Nick said to me one day, well, what about property? And um, I already had a flat in London that I had been unable to sell. Uh, because I couldn't rent, I couldn't sell it because it had a defective lease. So I'd rented it out. Okay. Um, so I was an accidental landlord, and I <laughs> realised that I could do it. Um, and so we basically committed to go into it. You know, really get committed to it. And uh, we got really started in 2004, and we built our portfolio from there. Over £2 billion a year is overpaid on stamp duty, with up to a quarter of purchasers paying the wrong amount. From millionaire developers to residential homeowners, anyone may be affected by these errors. Contact us today to see if you have overpaid your stamp duty and owed a refund from HMRC. So here you are, you're an accidental landlord, you've made the commitment to become landlords between you. So. What were those early days like? Did you do have to do much research or did you just play with your gut instinct as, as to what you should buy? I'm, I'm curious. Well, for our sins, we went on a course by Inside Track. Oh, did you? Um, OK. And that actually was what gave us a kickstart to get going. And I, and I think this goes back to what we're going to talk about, which is why education is so important. Mm. We learned so much um, on the Inside Track course, but we met other people that were doing it and that really inspired us as well. And, and we, both myself and my husband, we just really, really committed to it. We said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to learn and 
you know, find out as much as we can, talk to the right people, get the right advice, um, and that's what we did. So we built our portfolio from 2004 to around 2009. So we um, had one or two bedroom apartments in, in London, in, in postcodes we favor, like um, North and East London. Um, then we moved into family homes in the southeast. Um, and then we ended up with two coastal holiday lets as the kind of missing piece of the puzzle around 2009. So we haven't bought any property since then. We've just been in a consolidation mode um, since then. Yeah, because of course we had the crash and everything else. Yeah, so yeah, of course. You're, cons you're there, you're consolidating. We all saw the damage that that crash did, particularly to over leveraged portfolios at the time. There was a lot of fallout, as we all know. Yeah. Um, I can remember doing some deals on what are called haircut deals, and you, you, you're probably yeah, familiar. Yeah, I remember that, yep. Um, and quite significant numbers were involved, not just in the private rental sector, but also in the development sector, yep. where I think we had uh, some very interesting quasi-banking organisations organised by governments, including the Irish and the Northern Ireland and yep. over the UK, to reconstruct the, the construction industry, which largely seems to have worked or it would appear to have worked over the last 12 years so when did the idea for property tribes come along and why property tribes well it came along in around 2000 I think it was February 2009 to be exact um, and I'd been on some other forums the social web was very much in its infancy and I'd been on to you might remember singing pig as one of them Vaguely, um, yes. and they, these forums were like the Wild West uh, you know it's anonymous people there was a lot of flaming a lot of trolling a lot of abuse um, and and I didn't think it was the right environment because uh, being a landlord is a is, is, is a business and I think you have to be professional and I said to my husband Nick one day I said I, I want somewhere where I can have a professional conversation and debate with other professional landlords or like-minded landlords and he said oh, I'll tell you what I'll set you up on some free software um, and you know you can chat away to your heart's content um, and you can set your own standards about you know how, how the forum runs so he set me up on some free software and we called it um, property tribes because we were both uh, fans of the American marketeer Seth Godin and he was the one that came up with this concept of tribes people hanging out in in, in tribes of shared interest essentially so yes. you might be a member of many tribes I'm, I'm a member of the cat lovers tribe I'm a member of the motorhoming tribe I'm a member of um, you know the property tribe so we thought we'll set it up as property tribes and then we'll have different tribes for different topics so we have a tax tribe a mortgages and finance tribe a buy to let tribe a holiday let's tribe an HMO tribe you get the picture yeah um, and then we curated everything uh, in into this into these different tribes to make it easy to find what you were looking for um, and then after about two years, we, we looked one day and, and we saw that we had 10,000 members and we were like, wow, we've got something here, but we, we weren't quite sure what it was, but we decided to move the entire community onto our own software, which obviously was quite a Herculean task because we had a lot of content and a lot of members. We did that um, and then it grew and grew and grew some more. And then we were funding it all ourselves with the server time and, and everything. And my husband said, look, it's going to have to pay, pay for itself now. Um, and we decided to monetize it. And my husband, Nick, came up with this idea of, um, you know, advertising and sponsorship. Yes. So each tribe has a sponsor relevant to that category. Um, and that's how we've monetized it. So it now supports itself um, and it's a free to use community resource uh, to share landlord knowledge and, and information and opinion. Um, and we have a nice ecosystem of trusted partners um, of legitimate products and services for landlords. That's excellent. Yeah. I think there's a long been criticism that certain, some other communities, mm. shall we say, seem to be dominated by commercial interests that only push their agenda. But mm. you, you've clearly set yours up with a mind that the community has a voice. Yeah. There may well be a, a relevant sponsor, but they don't get the absolute editorial right over the content no, of discussion. No, definitely not, no. So very much a free speech platform in that sense. Well, you know, my free speech has got me into trouble. Well, so. I know, but we're not going to discuss that today. <laughs> which, which, which of us born in our generation has never got into trouble because of our free speech? But uh, enough said. <laughs> enough said. I think, you know, so you are, you've got tribes, you're hearing a lot of feedback. 
What do you think the current sentiment is in the private rental community? I mean, we have these challenges of inflation, interest rate rises, but nevertheless surplus demand for PRS property. What's the sentiment? Is it neutral, positive or negative? Well, it's really interesting because obviously being a community manager, I do see all the landlord pain that's out there because we've got hundreds of comments every day coming in and, you know, actual anecdotal evidence that landlords are experiencing. And as you mentioned, we're at the Landlord Investment Show now, um, and it's great to see so many landlords out in force. Um, I think a lot of landlords are very concerned um, uh, uh, this white paper has, has been, you know, very concerning some of the direction of travel in that. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, I think that, you know, it's going to be the informed and educated landlord that, that does survive and thrive. Um, there will always be opportunity in property. Um, you've got to see the angles, you've got to get the right advice from the right source. Um, and you've got to keep the faith with it. And I, I, I've been a landlord, as I mentioned, now since 1992, but a portfolio landlord since 2004. And property's always served me well. Mm. And I, I'm going to stick with it. And I believe in, you know, we are in a highly inflationary environment. I think that those landlords that stick with it, uh, you know, we've got cash flowing assets in an inflationary environment. Um, tend to do very, very well. So if people keep the faith, keep their properties um, in good condition, provide a good service for their tenants, um, have a long-term view, I think they're going to come out absolutely fine. I, I mean, I would agree with you. I think the economics are good, but we have faced this reform to leases. There are now, you cannot do ground rents on new leases. And that's potentially going to threaten management charges as well, which is yep. potentially going to affect things. I'm like you, I'm, I'm peripherally interested in these reforms. I mean, the abolition of no-fault evictions, I, I commented on a blog the other week, I have no problem with that, provided some of the landlord's powers to deal with delinquent tenants are actually improved, mm -hmm. as we all know, and I'm sure you would, you would attest. You get a problem tenant, it can take anywhere up to from five months to nearly a year to get rid, by which time you've lost income, your property's been destroyed. I'm sure you've probably had that experience. Certainly the forum would have had the experience. And at the moment, for my own part, I think we need to stop weakening landlords and start actually stabilising and providing a degree of balance in the sector. But what, what are your thoughts? Well, I totally agree with you. I think, you know, what, what the media and what the government doesn't seem to understand is that the, the, the margin you make as a landlord, which, as we have been saying, is shrinking, that margin is to compensate you for taking on the risk of having a non-paying tenant or a tenant that or, and or damages your property. Um, if that margin is too slim uh, for landlords to consider taking off on that risk, then they're, they're either going to exit or they're not going to come into the sector in the first place. So, um, you know, it, it is challenging times uh, for landlords for sure. And, they've got to be able to see that they can gain possession of their properties. It, it's so important from the point of view of confidence. I mean, I've got a friend who's got um, about 100 properties, and he said to me, Vanessa, if Section 21 is abolished, he said, I'm out. I, I, I don't want to be a landlord anymore if, if I don't feel that I have the confidence to gain possession of my properties. And we've just done a debate in the show, actually, and that was very much the feeling among the landlord community and I think it's very concerning that the, the government is um, putting so many restrictions on landlords and, and property owners as to how they can use their properties and uh, and so on but the, then the government aren't actually you know providing any social housing and not building any new properties so you know, they seem to want to be taking control of other people's assets and dictating how they're used and so on. And I think that's so concerning. Um, it's a very, very unhealthy direction of travel, in my opinion. But, um, yeah, I mean, this white paper, it's, it's just very broad brush strokes. Um, there's not much detail in it, which I think has caused a lot of issues with, with the landlord community. Um, many people are making decisions now based on things in the white paper that may never come to fruition. Indeed. So I think the answer is to keep your powder dry and only act on things that actually go into statute and law. And as I said before, do get the right advice from the right sources. And it's worth paying for professional advice. I mean, landlords are 
you know, they're, they're very, <laughs> they don't like to put their hand in their pocket. And, uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes I think it's so important that you do. It can save you tens of thousands. Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, just, just in, in our area, yeah, the stamp duty, we, yeah. we have seen so many, I will call them avoidable errors and avoidable disasters if they'd only been willing to pay for advice. And not just in the area of portfolio incorporation and stuff like that, which has practically been de rigueur since they uh, abolished higher rate relief. But simple structuring decisions that, frankly, you know, paying for an hour's advice would, would have saved tens, if not hundreds of thousands of pounds of yeah. wastage. And logically, if they want a healthy private rental sector, and I was talking here today to somebody who said, there's a massive undersupply. We're trying to get landlords to deliver more. So you, at, a, at a local authority level, there's a you know, oh, yeah, perception they need desperate. it. They they're need desperate. it. The national government is putting in taxing policies and yep. regulation designed yep. to kill the PR. Massive, massive disconnect. There's, yeah, huge deal. I was about to say, it, there seems to be a policy disconnect between yeah, Whitehall and, and the country. Um, how do we go around correcting that? I mean, do we lobby for it? Do we have petitions? Do we march? What do we do? I don't know. I think, you know, we should all join um, the National Residential Landlords Association. They are, you know, in the, in the corridors of power. They are on different government committees and so on. Um, they do do a good job under challenging circumstances. Um, we can write to our MPs. Um, you know, we can speak out in the media um, and, and we can be good landlords and, you know, the, the, the media just loves to hit on an anti-landlord story because, of course, we're not the most liked people in the world. I think we're down there with estate agents and, and bankers and, and whatnot. But, um, you know, there are many, many good landlords out there that have uh, provide decent standard accommodation, who have supported tenants through the pandemic. Um, I, I, I myself um, help my tenants out with, um, you know, reduced rent payments and things like that. Um, you know, we need to shout more about um, the good stuff that we do and that yeah. we do provide a good standard of decent accommodation. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, it's, a, it's a very tricky one because this government um, is just hell-bent on... Uh, Gove has actually said, I want to shrink the private rented sector. Well, I, I don't know where he thinks everybody's going to end up living. I really don't, because a lot well, of people cannot afford a deposit for a property. They don't have a credit rating to get a residential mortgage, or they don't want the responsibility of it. So, you know, we should have, we should have lots of different tenures um, that people can choose from, and that's healthy. Yeah, I would agree. Of course, in the short term, of course, we can all just go around to Michael Gove's and move in at his house, but uh, <laughs> pretty certain he would... Uh, start to uh, remove his objections at that point. Well, I, I do laugh at the Telegraph. They called him, uh, they said he was a one-man economic catastrophe. That was how they described I him. I didn't read the article, but I can understand uh, why the Telegraph might think that. So we're kind of saying that for the private rental sector, I, I seem to hear you saying, correct me if I'm wrong, hang in there, let's see what the white paper says. The economics of PRS still look really good at the moment. Um, yeah, I mean, what's, I your, give what, you a... what's your what's your five year view? I'm going to ask you two questions: the five year view for the PRS, and then the five year view for Property Tribes. Oh, crikey! <laughs> um, I think not that I like putting people on the spot, but you know. uh, well, I think there will be a period of contraction because people are struggling with the taxation, they're struggling with the regulation, uh, they don't like the removal of Section 21. Um, you know, we were talking today that the, the new EPC regulations are, are, could even be a bigger threat than the removal of Section 21. Again, we're told it's coming in in 2025, but it's not definite. Some people are saying 2026 now. We've got making tax digital. Not my favourite thing, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> so there's lots of things to put, um, well, put landlords off. So I think we will see shrinkage. Um, the pendulum has swung very much towards, uh, you know, tenants. Um, and I think it's going to have to start swinging back towards landlords, to be honest. Um, otherwise, we'll become an endangered species. Um, rents will go up and there'll be increasing homelessness. So, you know, the government putting people into um, emergency accommodation or B&Bs, it, it costs so much more than housing a tenant with a private landlord. So, yeah. um, you know, it's of interest to all taxpayers that there are good housing solutions out there. Um, I think for property tribes, um, I don't know really. Um, it, it, 
It's, I would say it's probably more of a lifestyle business for myself and Nick. We make money from our properties. Um, I do a bit of consultancy work on the side um, and some other bits and pieces. I still do video production. So I have a few income streams. I, I, do, I don't take an income from Property Tribes. I help on a voluntary basis. My husband, it, it supports him. Um, I think it supports a lifestyle that, that we enjoy, um, you know, with our motorhome and whatnot. Um, but I think, you know, my, my husband's also invested in fintech, um, so we have a, a very nice investment in that. And I think that's ultimately which will probably pay off the mortgages on our, on our properties, truth be told. But um, I think, you know, we want to keep PT there for a community resource and just keep improving it and keep improving um, the, the, the knowledge and um, the, the information that we share and the contributors that we have and the interviews that we do um, and just keep making it bigger and better. I'm, I'm, and I'm pleased to hear it because I think the resources like that are going to be needed in the future. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, you know, just to the, pulling up on a couple of things that you said, I mean, you know, my first thought was when you said the, the landlords were down there with bankers and estate agents. My first thought was a T-shirt emblazoned with the slogan, I'm a landlord, don't blame me. It was an estate agent and a banker that got me into this position. <laughs> um, and the other one is, is then I always remember uh, people around my office will say when they announced they were making tax digital, I actually sent an email around saying, I'll believe it when they make tax logical. Um, it's not happening. Um, MTD, frankly, is just a way to collect money faster. It's got nothing to do with rationalising, simplifying or codifying the tax system, which we already all admit is too complicated and leads to too many mistakes. So, hopefully, hopefully, we will see a, a cleaner, clearer law, both for landlords in terms of how, what they're allowed to do and not do, in terms of tax law, and a degree of rationality, but we simply cannot have a continuation of a disconnect between national government policy and Michael Gove saying hammer the landlords let's reduce them at the same time as we have increased demand and pressures on our housing system because people need places to live. No you're absolutely right I mean I can just share quickly an anecdotal thing I had a one bed flat in N5 to relet about um, uh, three weeks ago I had 107 applications in 48 hours. Oh my lord. I had 17, most of them didn't qualify. I had 17 viewings on a Saturday, all 17 turned up, and I had four make offers, and they were £100 above the asking price of the outgoing tenant. So that just shows how massive demand there was. Yes, I agree. And unfortunately, that um, situation as far as the, the poor people looking for property doesn't look likely to end very soon. No. For landlords, one might argue it's an opportunity. Mm. Um, that's market pressures, of course. Yes, so indeed. We're, we're just going to have to see where the market settles out and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah. Well, listen, I'm going to close this now because actually we could, we could probably keep going for the next couple of hours and it's not supposed to be that long an episode. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Oh, thank you. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, if you've liked this video, please look up Property Tribes. We'll put a link in the description below. It's an absolutely lovely lady, knows a lot, probably hasn't even had a chance to get 10% of what she knows out. If you like the video, click like and subscribe. Subscribe to us. Subscribe to their channel as well. I've been David Hanna. This has been Coffee and Property for Cornerstone Tax. Thank you for listening. Thank you, David.